And this comes to us then from Notker, and he says the following, quote, At the moment when Charlemagne had begun to reign as sole king in the western regions of the world, two Scots from Ireland happened to visit the coast of Gaul in the company of some British traders. These men were unrivaled in their knowledge of sacred and profane letters at a time when the pursuit of learning was almost forgotten throughout the length and breadth of Charlemagne's kingdom, and the worship of the true God was at a very low ebb. They had nothing on display to sell, but every day they used to shout to the crowds in the marketplace, quote, if anyone wants some wisdom, let him come to us and receive it for it is wisdom we have to sell. They announced that they wanted to sell wisdom because they saw that the people were more interested in what had to be paid for than in anything given for free. Either they really thought they could persuade the crowds who were buying other things to pay for wisdom too, or else, as subsequent events proved to be true, they hoped that by making this announcement, they would become a source of wonder and astonishment. They went on shouting their wares in public so long that at the end of the news, at the end, the news was carried by the onlookers, who certainly found them remarkable and maybe thought them wrong in the head, so it came to the ears of Charlemagne himself, who was always an admirer and great collector of wisdom. He ordered them to be summoned to his presence immediately, and he asked them if it was true, as everyone was saying, that they had brought wisdom with them. They answered, yes, indeed, we have it. And in the name of God, we are prepared to impart it to any worthy folk who seek it. When Charlemagne asked them what payment they wanted for wisdom, they answered, we make no charge, king. All we ask is a place suitable for us to teach in, talented minds to train, and in addition, of course, food to eat and clothes to wear, for without these, our mission cannot be accomplished. Charlemagne was delighted to receive this answer. For a short time, he kept them both with him. Later on, when he was obliged to set out on a series of military expeditions, he established one of the two, who was called Clement, in Gaul itself. In his care, he placed a great number of boys chosen not only from the noblest families, but also from middle class and poor homes. And he made sure that food should be provided and that accommodation suitable for study should be made available. Charlemagne sent the second man to Italy and put him in charge of the monastery of St. Augustine near the town of Papia, so that all who wished might join him there and receive instruction from him. And this was Charlemagne's really uh, kind of vision. And this does represent a rather unexpected aspect of a ruler in, at this time in history. But he deeply believed that if a people is provided the opportunity to learn that it will raise the moral character. And while, of course, the jury is still out as to whether that's always the case, nevertheless, I think in general, it is safe to say that ignorance doesn't breed virtue nearly as readily as the opportunity for learning, and especially as Charlemagne was interested in it, learning such that a person became more astute and competent in matters of faith and truth and so on, and that was really his objective. One of the most astonishing things about Charlemagne's schools was that he really was interested in students being enrolled in these schools simply on a demonstrated interest and competence for learning. Payment was not an issue. He picked up the tab himself. It was also not a function of nobility. In fact, there's a later story told by Notker in which after Charlemagne had been away for a while, he came back to check up on how these students were doing. And he saw that the noble students were, generally speaking, lazy, disinterested, lackadaisical, and that the poor students, students from poor families, were studying like mad, were demonstrating a much greater and much higher uh, interest and, and mastering this material more readily. And uh, in a famous incident, Charlemagne separated to his right hand and his left, the students, you see. And on his left hand, he had these noble students who weren't doing so well, and on his right hand, he had these students who were doing very well, who tended to come from the poorer classes. And he voiced to them his congratulations and made promises to them that they would be richly rewarded 
for their labors and for their uh, interest in learning and so on, that he had a place for them in his kingdom and so on. Then he turns to the others and he chewed them out royally, you see, for their laziness and for their mentality of just expecting everything to be handed to them on a silver platter. And the life of Charlemagne is filled with that kind of anecdotal stuff. I, you just have to know there's something of that is the truth of the matter, that he really was a person of some great personality, some great in, understanding of human psychology, and really, for that reason alone, is a lot of fun to study and read. So that all, that, that all kind of begins with these Irish monks. There was one particular scholar at the time, a man named Alcuin of York, he was British, he was widely regarded as the greatest scholar of the day, and Charlemagne negotiated heavily to have him come, and this man became the great architect in many ways of the educational prog program that was implemented under Charlemagne's watch, and so Alcuin is a name you'll sometimes run into in that connection as well. If I can just return you uh, for a moment to our text uh, from Proverbs. I've always, whenever I, first time I read that story about those two monks, of course, what comes immediately to mind is the wisdom personified there in the uh, book of Proverbs, standing out there in the street corner inviting people to come. One of the interesting little kind of uh, trilogy ideas in the book of Proverbs is organized around the three words, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And you'll many times see them, sometimes in the same verse, repeated many, many times. If you read the book of Proverbs, you, of course, recognize that. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. A case can be made that they are simply synonymous. But if there is a subtle difference between them, then the subtle difference, I believe, comports rather nicely with the definition of the elements of faith that would come later at the time of the Reformation. At the time of the Reformation, we have notitia, ascensus, and fiducia, if you know those terms. Notitia is the Latin word that means knowledge. And so faith, according to the Reformers and through Christian history, has in part depended on knowing something. It's not possible to exercise faith in a cognitive vacuum. There has to be something there. That's why the Christian message has been a message. We don't go around the world telling people to feel something. We begin by trying to instruct them in knowing something. They may feel something eventually, but they can't feel anything about something they don't know, you see. And so we proclaim a gospel, good news, notitia, a message, knowledge. But of course, more than knowledge, faith requires that there be some kind of view of that knowledge. There has to be some sort of recognition of its truth, which may be what that book, what the book of Proverbs calls understanding. It's one thing to know something, it's another thing to really get it. That is to say, to recognize its truth. That's the, what the Reformers called a sensus, to assent to its truth. It's one thing to know the proposition, Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago, and you know, claim to be dying in the place of sinners or some such thing. It's another thing to actually believe that's true, you know, to actually embrace the truth of that and accept it. But even that doesn't quite get us to full-orbed faith. And so the book of Proverbs also refers to wisdom. And wisdom has not so much to do with simply knowing something or even believing something, but truly acting upon it entrusting myself to it. And that's what the reformers call fiducia. You know the word fiduciary. A fiduciary is somebody in whom you entrust your interests, a trustee, a fiduciary. And the sense the reformers had in mind was that you need to make the gospel, which is another way of saying you need to make Christ your fiduciary. You entrust yourself to him. You put yourself in his care, not just knowing, not just believing, but actually acting in a way that embraces that. I like all of those qualities because I think they all do describe Charlie Maine. I think he was more than just a student. He was more than just a someone that believed the truth of it. I really do think, as you look at his life, that he was attempting as much as he could to entrust himself into the care of this message that meant so much 
to him. But of course, it uh, also raises the question for each of us, doesn't it? Uh, you know, we can know it, we can believe it. Have you truly entrusted yourself to it? I would expect that in this room, everybody here has done so, but it never hurts to ask yourself the question one more time, does it? It never hurts to go back and just revisit that one more opportunity. Have I really entrusted myself to Christ? You know it. I bet every one of you in this room believes it's true. Do you like it? Do you love it? Have you taken that Lord Jesus Christ, who is evidently and certainly the centerpiece of history, the Lord of history, the King of the universe, the one before whom your knees will bow sooner or later, have you said to him, I love you, I give my life to you, I embrace you? That's a question that only you can ask and answer in the confines of the deepest reaches of your own heart and conscience, isn't it? But it's a question we all need to ask and an answer we all need to hear. And sooner or later, we will stand before this one and we will give an answer. And I've always appreciated Charlie May and I think he tried to live as best he knew how within the context of his day according to a clear conscience before Christ so he could give a good answer when he would meet that one day, sir.